everyone, my name is Kevin Nelson. We are at another Catholic destination today. We are in Le Jour, France. We're at the Sanctuary of Saint Therese. And this is a, a beautiful basilica that I'm standing in front of. It uh, took about 10 years to build back in the early 30s all the way until it was dedicated into the 1950s. We're going to take you inside and show you the beauty, the beautiful mosaics that are inside, also show you the crypt as well, and tell you a little bit about the story of Saint Therese. So please stay with us as we journey through the sanctuary of Saint Therese of Le Jour, France, here on Catholic Destinations. <music> This beautiful basilica is a tribute to one of the great saints of the church, Saint Therese, living her simple life, giving her everyday struggles and chores up to the Lord, was and continues to be an inspiration and a resource for many people throughout the world. People have been coming to Lisieux for many years to visit this basilica and to walk in the footsteps of Therese. Uh, so many of them coming from all over the world uh, to thank Therese and to pray Therese and to get to know Therese also. And um, that's something very important here in Lisieux Therese. Of course, that's because of her that this place is a well-known place in the world. That's because of her that we have about 800,000 pilgrims coming every year. And that's really a place where we keep many souvenirs of Therese. We have the very places where she lived, the house where she grew up, uh, the church where she went to Mass, uh, the, the parish church, which is still the parish church of the town. There, are, there is the Carmelite convent uh, where uh, she lived during nine years and where she died at 24 years old on the 30th of September 1897. Who was this young girl who died at such a young age but made such an impact in the world of faith? Who became the universal patroness of the missions? secondary patron of France and doctor of the church. Well, in order to learn more about St. Therese, we have to go back to the beginning. Therese Martin was born in Alencon, France on January 2nd, 1873 to Louis Martin and Zélie Gorin. Therese was the ninth child of the couple, four of whom died in infancy. The remaining five were all girls. At just four and a half years of age, Therese and her family suffered a terrible tragedy. Zélie Guérin died of breast cancer at the age of 44. With five girls to care for, Louis, at the invitation of his brother-in-law, moved the family to Les Jours, into Les Bousinets. Therese would spend the next 11 years there. We are now here at the home of Therese. Uh, her family moved here in 1877 after the passing of her mother, and uh, she lived here for 11 years before she entered the monastery. After the death of her mother, Therese's sister Pauline became a surrogate mom to Therese. However, Pauline had decided to join the Carmelite convent, and with the departure of Pauline came a sickness and Therese fell seriously ill. Nothing seemed to be able to cure her. Many prayers were offered by the family as well as the sisters at the Carmelite convent. Finally, on the 13th of May, 1883, a statue of the Virgin Mary, which was in one of the rooms at the house, smiled at Therese, and she was instantly cured. Another significant event in the young life of Therese was her first Holy Communion, which she made in 1884 at the School of the Benedictine Nuns. At that point, she was already thinking of becoming a Carmelite, and her other sister Marie, who she'd grown attached to since Pauline left, had decided to join the Carmelites as well. After struggling through her early years, unable to cope very well, suffering from hypersensitivity and obsessive scruples, she had a conversion experience on Christmas of 1886. After Mass, she felt strong and touched by the grace of God's love in the Eucharist. She felt transformed and ready to face the task ahead of her.
During a pilgrimage to Italy, Therese came to the awareness that her calling was not only to pray for the conversion of sinners, but to pray for priests as well. During this same pilgrimage, Therese asked Pope Leo XIII to be permitted to enter the Carmelite convent at the age of 15 years. She received the answer, if God wills. On April 9, 1888, Therese headed to the monastery and said goodbye to Les Bouzinets. At the time Therese entered the convent, there were 26 sisters in it, their average age being 47. They prayed together for six and a half hours every day, two hours of which were spent in contemplative prayer. They worked to earn a modest living. They had two hours for communal recreation, and fasting was very severe. They rose at 5.45 a.m. in the morning and went to bed at about 11 p.m. In 1894, Therese was dealt another heartbreak as her father, Louis, died. Therese's sister, Celine, who had been caring for him during his sickness, entered the Carmelite convent. Now, three of Therese's sisters were at the convent. Therese's name in the convent was St. Therese of the Child Jesus of the Holy Face and she discovered more fully in the convent God's merciful love. She used love as her charism. During this time, she was asked by her sister, Mother Agnes, who was prioress of the convent, to write her memories of her childhood. She wrote 86 pages. It wasn't long after her father died that she began to feel the effects of tuberculosis. While her body struggled with the disease, her soul struggled with her vocation of childlike and merciful love. She was soon asked to be the spiritual sister to two missionary priests, and she also took charge of five novices and spent her time teaching them the childlike way. Finally, on September 30th, 1897, at the age of 24, Therese died. It was the day that she would begin her prophecy that she would spend her heaven doing good on earth. One year after her death, the book based on her writings, The Story of a Soul, was published and it continues to transform lives. The following year, 1899, the Carmelite nuns received so many letters asking for the book that they had to reprint the book. And not only a few copies, thousands and thousands of copies and every year after they had to reprint and very soon it will be translated into different languages. The first two translations took place in 1901 that was in English and Polish first and every year afterwards there was a new translation, more than 20 translations in less than 30 years. So the fame of Therese really came from her writings, from story of a soul. Therese's body was buried in the town cemetery of Lisieux but was later moved to the Carmelite convents. The town cemetery is the place where Therese, when she died, was first buried and where the first pilgrims who came to Lisieux went to pray until 1923, which was the year when Therese was beatified by Pius XI and when the nuns obtained, the Carmelite nuns, obtained the permission of having the tomb transferred from the cemetery to the Carmel church. So, the very first place of pilgrimage was the tomb of Therese in the cemetery. And that's the place where the first graces were obtained, where the first miracles were obtained. To this day, pilgrims still come and visit and venerate the remains of St. Therese in the chapel of the reliquary. Some of her remains have been inserted into the figure which represents her on her deathbed. Almost all of the relics are enclosed in a casket underneath the reliquary. Every year on the last Sunday in September, the relics are brought in procession through the Jure. Above the reliquary is a statue of the Virgin Mary, which is the same statue that cured Therese by her beautiful smile on May 13, 1883, at her home in Les Bouzinets. It wasn't long after her death 
and the publishing of her book that the process began to have her declared a saint. Pope Pius XI beatified Therese in 1923, and then in May of 1925, he canonized her. The fame of Therese increased very, very quickly at the beginning of the 20th century. And when the process was opened in 1910, uh, the process went very quickly and she was made a saint uh, in 1925, so less than 30 years after her death. And the crowds of people were coming more and more numerous. And so there was the need of a big place to receive them, a big church to receive them. And uh, that's how the basilica was built in 1929. In 1929, yeah, they started to build the basilica. This basilica, the project of building the basilica was uh, deeply uh, encouraged by the Pope, Pius XI, who loved Therese so much. He is the one who canonized Therese. He is the one who proclaimed Therese a patroness for mission and missionaries. The idea for a new basilica met with some opposition at first. Many at the time thought Therese's popularity had waned. However, Bishop Lemonnier was not persuaded. In 1925, he commissioned a Parisian architect to draw up a preliminary design. But the proposed design provoked many criticisms. It was felt that the proportions were not large enough. An internationally respected architect from the north of France, Mr. Louis-Marie Cordonnière, was asked to submit a design. With the Pope's desire and the backing of the local bishop, opposition decreased and Cordonnière's design was approved. Work began in 1929. The foundation stone was laid on September 30th. The basilica was built, um, well, they needed about 10 years to build the church, 1939. That was the end of the big um, building, I would say. And that will be only after the Second World War, from the end of the 1940s, that they will make all the decoration of the church, and the church will be consecrated in 1957. Through the generosity of Christians throughout the world, the Esplanade, the Way of the Cross, the Crypt, and the Basilica itself were completed and paid for in less than 10 years. There is a crypt which was uh, built uh, in 1932. Uh, the, 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 the crypt, if the, the basilica is bigger and really wants to illustrate um, the spirituality of Therese, in the crypt uh, we have a, a very much different atmosphere. The colors are very much different. The, the colors in the crypt are, um, are blue, uh, pink, very beautiful greens, it's beautiful, the mosaics of the crypt. And it's all uh, about nature, all the love of Therese for nature. Therese writes some very beautiful pages about nature, comparing the world to, the, the, to, to, to nature, saying that in a garden, if you have only one kind of flower, the garden is not that beautiful, you know, the, the beauty comes from the differences, from the diversity and that in his garden, Jesus has many kind of flowers, roses, lilies, the great saints, but he also has daisies, the little ones. So everybody has its own place in that garden. And for Therese, she says that the book of nature really taught her about that great love of God for, for, for the world, for, for his children. So in the crypt, that's what was uh, uh, meant to illustrate that great love of Therese for nature and that that's really a book where God expresses so many things. In 1958, 
the crypt was completed with the laying of five mosaics representing the important stages in Therese's life. In the crypt above the altar, there is a huge statue of Therese with her hands up to heaven and the last words Therese said before dying, which are written in French all around, Oh, I love him, my God, I love you. Oh, je l'aime, mon Dieu, je vous aime. These are her last words. Well, now that we've seen some of the grounds outside and we've taken you downstairs into the crypt, let's go inside to the main basilica and show you some of the beautiful mosaics. Also, the relic of St. Therese is inside. So come on in. The Upper Basilica, which can seat about 3,000 pilgrims, is a stunning display of mosaics and stained glass windows. They were produced by Pierre Godin, who was trained in the great tradition of the glass arts of the Middle Ages. The color of the glass is used to encourage contemplation. Only a small amount of sunlight is required in order for Pierre Godin's windows to create a particularly warm atmosphere in the basilica. Under the influence of Father Germain, first rector of the basilica, the artist gave priority to his love for abstract art. Without making the windows into pictures of glass, he conceived of a figurative project to give pilgrims a way to see the central message of Therese through his work. The priest uh, who was in charge of uh, following all the building of the basilica, Monseigneur Germain, who was from the diocese, uh, was someone with a very strong idea of what the basilica should be. And he, as far as the decoration, as the mosaics and the stained glass windows inside are concerned, he really wanted something special here in Lisieux. And he asked too many specialists theologian, etc., to think of, um, of a decoration for the church. And each time they were giving him something, he, he was not satisfied with that because he thought that was a kind of decoration you could find in any other church, in any other place in, in the world. So um, at last, he decided to make the decoration, the program of the decoration himself. And so he took the books of Therese story of a soul. He took the manuscripts of Therese, the whole things she wrote herself, and after this he made the decoration of the church. So all the mosaics and stained glass windows of the basilica are not here to tell the story of Therese because we still have the very places where she lived to tell about her, but the message of Therese, the little way of love and confidence uh, the spiritual childhood, the spirituality of Therese is expressed all through the mosaics and the stained glass windows. So the main mosaic, the one above the altar, expresses all the love and mercy of God for his children. And the answer of Therese to that great love of the Father is the answer of a child who abandons herself totally with confidence to the arms of her father. And if you take the book of Therese, Story of a Soul, in the very last pages, very last page, you read the very last words she wrote, I go to God through confidence and love. And these two words are illustrated in the basilica through the two big stained glass windows we have in the transept of the church. A blue window at north, which expresses confidence as the color blue tra traditionally is the color symbolizing confidence. And above the relics of Therese in the Basilica at south, we have a big red stained glass windows which expresses charity. Inside the main basilica is a special section 
where relics from St. Therese are kept. Here, pilgrims and visitors can light a candle, say a prayer, or have a conversation with Therese. The tomb of Therese is kept in the convent, in the church of the convent. But when the basilica was, it was built, of course, in the basilica, we usually keep some relics of the saint who is venerated, who the people come to pray in the church. And so, uh, after the building of the basilica, it was decided that some relics would be brought from the convent to the basilica. And they chose uh, among the relics of Therese the bones of her right arm. That is, you, won't have, you don't have the hand, but from the wrist to the shoulder, you have the bones of the right arm of Therese. And the reliquary where they are displayed was given to the Basilica by Pius XI. And if the choice the choice of these bones, rather than any other, other part of her body, uh, comes from the fact that she wrote the story of her life. And this is something very important because, of course, when you are a nun of 15 years old, uh, entering the convent at 15 years old, when you die in the convent at 24, nobody knows you. Therese was clustered in the convent. so. What made Therese's, Therese known after her death was the printing of a book that was her own writings, not something she had written on her own wish. That was not her own will. She started to write because she had to obey her prioress, her own sister Pauline, who asked her to write the story of their life, the story of her life. And these writings will be used after her death to make the obituary. And uh, that's really the book she had written with her right arm, which made Therese known all over the world. The bell tower houses 51 bells. The bell tone is sounded by six bells, the heaviest of which is the great bell, which displays its motto in bronze, I ring out the call of the peoples to unity and love. The chimes are played on the hour and on the half hour according to the liturgical season. The chimes of the Basilica of Lisieux are completely chromatic and possess a high sound quality they rank among the most beautiful in Europe. Therese's simple life became an important example to many in how to offer up all they do to the Lord. She has showered graces upon so many that many come to Lisieux to pay their respects and to say thank you. The people coming from the outside, sometimes traveling hours before coming, people coming from all over the four corners of the world, um, that's really... Uh, make us aware of how important it is to be here. And you, you know what happens when you're in a place, sometimes you get used to it and you forget. And when you have, you, you talk with people, with pilgrims, and they say, how, that's years I was expecting to come here. And then you realize what kind of place it is for, for, for them, for the people. What is very impressive is, um, what the people tell about the graces they receive from Therese. Therese, before she died, said that she would spend her time in heaven doing good on earth, that she would send a shower of roses on earth. And Therese is a poet. She wrote poems. All her writings are full of poetry, metaphors, comparison, etc. But that was not poetry when she said she would send a shower of roses because we have so many examples of, of this here. 
not things that are happening here necessarily, but so many people coming back after years sometimes, or people coming for the first time saying, I came to thank for this, for this, for this, and that's every day, and that's really impressive. Many say she's like my sister, someone, uh, no, she's not someone above you refer to, like, no, she's someone close to you. And many, many pilgrims uh, say this, that she's here with me. And they, they talk to her like you talk to a friend, like you, you talk to, to, to a sister, to a mother sometimes. But they, they, there is that very uh, personal, very individual personal relationship. Uh, between Therese and the pilgrims. And what is very important is that that relationship doesn't stop with Therese. I mean, the relationship is just like, yes, uh, uh, an, an elder sister who would take you by the hands to take you to Jesus. And that's, that's something that really here, we, we, we see that every day, every day. What a wonderful place, the sanctuary of St. Therese of Lejour. She is the universal patroness of the missions. She is a doctor of the church, and she's also the secondary patroness of France. And all this from a very sickly, very young nun. We'd like to thank you for joining us on our journey here through the sanctuary. We'd like to thank everybody here involved in helping us put this project together. And uh, we'd like to thank the viewers at home for watching along with us. My name's Kevin Nelson. I hope you enjoyed the program today, and I invite you back again next time for another Catholic Destination.